Early in 2837, Captain General Charles Maddock was approached by the director of SAFE, Morgan DeWitt. His efforts to root out the leak within their intelligence network had come up short, and he was forced to conclude that the issue lay elsewhere. Reviewing the successes and failures of their operations since entering the Second Succession War, Charles could see no obvious pattern to link them, which ultimately led him to question the information he was receiving from Comstar via his sister Jeanette, the presenter of Oriente. His worst fear was that Comstar was passing information to his enemies as often as they were to him. With the utmost secrecy, he ordered DeWitt to orchestrate Operation Cookie Jar. On February 1st, the Captain General arrived on Oriente, ostensibly for a meeting with Duke Harlan Allison, but while there, he would also make a surreptitious visit to see his sister, the presenter. In that later conversation, he dropped hints towards a discovery on the recently conquered Cursa, but did not elaborate beyond that. The trap was set. Meanwhile, dropships were departing from that world, bearing a classified heavy cargo. Communications back to Atreus via the orbital HPG station at Oriente, using codes that SAFE knew had been compromised by Comstar, spoke of an SLDF warehouse stocked with Starly Gear tech, the likes of which was near extinct following the widespread destruction of the First Succession War. The Free Wells League military was not idle while they waited for Comstar to take the bait. In fact, they were busy trying to repel a sweeping Liao counteroffensive in the early months of 2837, largely focused within the Duchy of Andurian. Though Duke Jonathan Humphreys managed to secure Karlstein, he faced a sudden reversal in fortune when the CCAF arrived at Ithaca, Leda, Matascogan, and Viribium. Further up the line, the Capella commonality reclaimed Bithynia and Propus and the Tikhonov commonality, Bellevue, Mancalanan, and Oronson, though here the losses were offset by the successful capture of the major factory world of Asuncion. Across the Inner Sphere on February 14th, a gift was delivered to Jinjiro Kurita's chambers within Unity Palace on Luthien. The ISF carried out extensive security checks on it to ensure that it contained no hidden threats to their coordinator before handing it over. There were no chemicals, explosives, or radiological hazards present, but there was one danger they overlooked, a psychological one. When Jinjiro opened the parcel and found within a toy soldier dressed in the uniform of the Star League Defense Force, he flew into a psychotic frenzy from which he would never escape. His half-brother, Zabu Kurita, was ultimately forced to call riot police into the palace in order to restrain him. Zabu's ascension to the position of coordinator was not without objection. Several within his family urged for the position to instead pass to one of his heirs, if only to appease the mustard soldiery with whom Zabu was not held in high regard. However, each of his children, Yoguchi, Rowena, and Miyogi, spoke in favor of their father. The deed was done, and the Combine would have to wait and see what manner of ruler he would be. Questions remain as to who was behind the doll that sent Jinjiro over the edge. No one has ever been definitively linked to the gift. Speculation has ranged from foreign intelligence agencies to another of Comstar's plots, but more convincingly, a member of the Kurita family. Could the coordinator's half-brother have intentionally broken Jinjiro's mind, knowing how the Minnesota tribe had terrified him a decade earlier? It seems out of character, but not beyond question. Every one of Zabu's children would also play an important part in Draconis Combine history. We won't get ahead of ourselves by discussing them now but suffice to say that each took a step closer towards their end goal with Jinjiro's removal. Back at Atreus, Charles Maddock was waiting for news of what felt at this point like an inevitable betrayal. Sure enough, on March 13th, the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces arrived in force on Cursa with three regiments. 
bypassing the actual military and industrial targets. They instead beelined straight for the remote location used by the cargo dropships in their ruse. Needless to say, there was no Starlink cache waiting for them. It was now known beyond a doubt that Comstar was manipulating the successor states into pointless battles that served only to make the great houses weaker. The Captain General's response was immediate. He dispatched his few remaining warships to Oriente, and on the 22nd, ordered them to bombard the orbiting HPG station into oblivion. 300 were killed within the complex, his sister Jeanette included. Word of the incident reached Primus Conrad Toyama three days later. This was the first direct challenge to Comstar since their founding. If he did not act quickly, their monopoly on interstellar communications could collapse, and the successor states might halt the war before his goal of dismantling their militaries could be achieved. Toyama was decisive in his next action. He issued a shunning proclamation to all HPG stations, Exclusion Order 2837-1. Henceforth, the Free Wells League was placed under a complete communications interdiction. The effect of this was disastrous to the wartime economy and governance of the successor state. Cutting off Tharkad back in 2823 had been damaging, but to shut down every HPG within a realm was ruinous. Sabotage prevented the Free Wells League from being able to restart the stations themselves. The adepts and presenters within their realm disappeared into hiding, and those few safe turned up could not be made to work for them. The Capellan Confederation and Lyran Commonwealth were at first uncertain as to how to proceed. It was unclear how Comstar would react to them taking hostile actions against a realm under interdiction. When Liao raids did not bring about any condemnation from Toyama, Steiner reasoned that other states were free to move into Matic territory. The LCAF didn't initially have the troops available, and instead rapidly expanded their citizen regiments to free up border garrisons for the assault. Their immediate aim was to cut off the Free Wells League from Terra before access to the HBG network was restored, starting with assaults in late April against Graham and Oliver. Both planets fell quickly. While these battles were still ongoing, Liao and Steiner were frantically making preparations for a much larger invasion to begin in the autumn. Toyama believed that six months of isolation would be enough to bring the Free Wells League to its knees. For violating the communications protocol of 2787, he demanded that Maddock make reparations to the tune of three times the cost of rebuilding the Oriente HPG station. During this period, Rom and Saif engaged in a shadow war, as each tried to subvert the other's efforts to enforce or contravene the communications interdiction. But the Captain General proved unexpectedly recalcitrant and refused to submit to Toyama. With the other successor states gearing up for a campaign that would surely demolish the Free Wells League should it go ahead, Comstar found itself in the awkward position of having to actually supply intelligence to the frontline FWLM units to warn them of the incoming threat. Hopefully, they could hold out long enough for their leader to see the error of his ways and back down. In August, the invasion got underway along both fronts, and yet Charles Maddock had still not yielded. By late September, Toyama called a halt to Rom's involvement in the Comstar War. The collapse of one of the successor states could seriously disrupt the balance of power and work counter to his long-term aims, but the exclusion order had to remain in place as its removal could set a dangerous precedent that the other great houses would surely exploit. These were nerve-wracking times for the Primus. The Lyrans opened with two separate thrusts. Quick-thinking Maddock commanders had taken the initiative to strike at suspected staging posts, delaying the invasion and buying them vital time. They even managed to briefly take control of Zosma, but the Steiner assault was all but inevitable. Ilion was the first target within the Dixie salient they hit, 
Then from there, they moved to Malazan. Towards Terra, they landed on Bordon, Callison, Marcus, and Zosma. The Capellans pushed in at three locations along the border. A trio of systems recently taken by Task Force Hammer were counterattacked Berenson, Kirkbacken, and Zion. The three most spinward planets of Kenyan salient were also hit Kori, Fact, and Wazan while the Duchy of Andurian came under attack at Claybrook, Lopez, and their capital. Some of these had only been intended as raids, but the defense was so disorganized that only on Andurian did the Free Wells League successfully hold on to its territory. Faced with imminent disaster, Captain General Charles Maddock ordered one of the most desperate and demoralizing commands any successor lord has ever given. Every unit within the FWLM occupying foreign territory was to withdraw to their Stali Gira defensive lines. A feeding frenzy ensued as both the Commonwealth and Confederation gorged themselves on the abandoned territories. The remainder of the Dixie salient was given back, as were several of the jointly administered planets along the old hegemony border. The commonalities gained far more. Tikhonov taking six systems, Sana five, Capella two, while Cyan and Andurian took three each. All of these were former Confederation holdings during the era of the Star League. Chancellor Lorelli Liao initially encouraged her forces to press onwards, but securing the territory behind them seemed the smarter move. Vincent's commandos briefly seized Ling and drove off a counterattack by the League's new mercenary unit, Nathan's Irregulars, but they were soon withdrawn to safer ground. Charles Maddock has the unfortunate distinction of being the man behind the greatest loss of territory in Free Wells League history. Only the duchies of Andurian and Orloff made significant efforts to hold on to their hard-won gains from the previous five decades though Liao would no doubt be turning towards them soon. The Captain General was crucified in Parliament for his decision, but with hindsight, we can see how the sudden influx of new systems to administer took the wind out of their opponent's sails. Guerrilla forces left behind by Maddock did not make their lives easy. It took time for them to reorganize, time the FWLM would need to set up new defensive lines themselves. Not all of the Maddox regiments would get that chance, as several never even received the recall orders and died stranded far ahead of the new border. Back in the Draconis Combine, things were coming to a head over Zabu Kurita's rule. On June 9th, 2838, he presented in court the budget for the next year. As coordinator of the people's reconstruction effort, Zabu was well aware of how technology was slipping away. Medical procedures that had been commonplace during the Star League might as well have been magic acts just half a century on. He wanted more funds to reverse this decline. In his budget was a modest 4% reduction in military spending. This was the final straw for the DCMS High Strategic Council. In a meeting three days later, they agreed that the only course of action available to them was the removal of the coordinator. Taisho Frederick Kazoma of the Procurement Evaluation Board was chosen for the honor. On June 23rd, he entered Zabu's bedchambers and drew his sword. Kurita was unperturbed. After asking whether the Taisho was acting alone, and being informed that he was in fact there on behalf of the High Council, Zabu Kurita accepted his fate. With Kazoma's blessing, he dressed in full ceremonial garb, wrote the traditional House Kurita death haiku, took one of his family's ancient wakazashi in hand, then drew it across his stomach. Frederick Kazoma then delivered the coup de grace. No action was ever taken to chastise the military afterwards for their assassination plot. Only Kazoma was sentenced to death for striking the killing blow, though even this proved contentious. The political pressure on Charles Maddock was ramping up in 2838. 
Parliament believed that his stubbornness in admitting fault to Comstar was about to bring the Free Wells League to ruin. Efforts to explain Toyama's duplicity fell on deaf ears. Opposition coalesced around Minister of Finance Hector Lombard, who planned to use what little power they still had post-Resolution 288 to bring the Captain General to heel. On June 24th, they blocked Maddox's proposed budget that would allow him to raise five new regiments to face off against the threat. They would not approve the bill until Charles made reparations towards Comstar. Only the reformed 13th Maddox militia got off the ground that year. The infighting came at the worst time for the FWLM, who had once again come under assault from the LCAF in May. One of Steiner's main objectives was to push towards the wealthy shipbuilding world of Tamarind. To that end, they took six planets from Maddox control in preparation for an assault the next year. Closer to Terra, they pushed into the Stuart commonality for the first time to take Tania Borealis, as well as the nearby Connaught, then the exposed Shiloh in August. It had taken the Capellan Confederation longer to get their affairs in order, chiefly because they were still dealing with the final actions of Operation Tiger in 2837. Apart from a raid on Andurian in January and eradicating some of the Orloff grenadiers who had fled to Susano, it wasn't until the mid-year that they began moving in force. Another trio of systems were taken back from Duke Jonathan Humphreys. An embarrassing side effect of the interdiction was that several mercenary contracts were about to expire when the edict came into effect, and the Free Wells League was unable to renew them through the ubiquitous Mercenary Review Board. Sensing which way the winds were blowing, those on Bonaire willingly went over to Liao, taking the planet with them. Van Diemen was one of the worst losses for Duke Harlan Allison. Though he would later rebuild it, one of his prized Fusiliers of Oriente brigades was destroyed, along with five supporting Marek militia battalions. Both of Harlan's sons are listed as casualties of the Comstar War. They most likely met their fate during this battle. Liao had little time to celebrate their victory. Before year's end, the system would change hands again, this time going to the Commonwealth. Steiner and Liao were not the only ones salivating over juicy targets within the Free Wells League. In 2838, Davian and Kurita got in on the action. Amusingly, they came to blows with each other more often than they did the natives. Alula Australis was one of the planets the Lyrans had planned to take, but a six-week battle with the AFFS left both forces incapable of achieving their objectives leaving the world as the sole surviving system within the Border Protectorate. Those on New Dallas saw a familiar sight of the succession wars in an unusual locale, the Fed Sons and Capellans going at it over what few resources of value were left on that nuclear-scarred world. The population of Talitha also watched with bemusement as distant foes, the AFFS and DCMS, landed in September then fought one another for the opportunity to steal anything of value before lifting off two months later. Those Proserpina Hazars dispatched to Christiansund didn't even realise that the system had already been claimed by the Capellans until they made landfall. Following Zabu Kurita's death, the title of Coordinator, as well as that of First Lord of the Star League, passed on to his eldest son, Yuguchi. He was already a respected officer within the Mustard Soldiery, which gave him a firm foundation from which to rebuild trust with the military district warlords. Wasting little time, in August 2838, Coordinator Yuguchi commenced the Fifth Battle of Hesperus. A total of seven regiments, two of which were battle mech commands, made landfall on the planet while a trio of warships secured the space lanes overhead. Their numbers allowed them to quickly take control of the planet's main population centres, leaving only the fortified mountain complexes in Steiner hands. The siege they had planned went both ways, however. It was extremely difficult for the Draconis Combine to resupply their positions so deep into the Lyran Commonwealth. Unable to force an opening, the DCMS ultimately withdrew. 
Yoguchi, like his father before him, had outlawed the use of nuclear weapons to raise the factories. Zabu had imparted on his son those same concerns about a technological decline, and he did not wish to add to it, even if those mechs would ultimately be used against him. Despite their failure, the expedition to Hesperus boosted morale within the DCMS and secured the new coordinator's position. Long term, they would return to the planet once again to finish the job. Freewell's parliament had reached a complete stalemate by this point. The MPs had realised that while Resolution 288 had given Maddock the right to declare war or make peace, they still held considerable influence over him by manipulating the purse strings. They could, in effect, make the continuation of war impossible. Hector Lombard's faction had blocked a move by the Captain General to conscript more forces, and then another bill on August 9th this time to press merchant jump ships into service as messengers as a way to avoid giving in to Comstar. The political pressure finally proved too much for Charles. On September 19th, he begrudgingly dispatched his son Garth aboard FWLS Dark Regret to Terra. There, he was called before the entire First Circuit. Toyama demanded that the Free Wills League be made to pay far beyond the original sum outlined in the exclusion order, but Garth held firm. Maddock would pay the exact amount and nothing more. After a few weeks of bitter discourse, the two sides agreed to a truce in mid-October. On November 9th, Comstar lifted their communications interdiction. 70% of the League's HBG stations came back online with the rest up and running by year's end. Only Oriente would remain cut off for the next three years, while Comstar rebuilt the facility. Toyama decreed that all future installations would be secure compounds built to withstand attack. It was only once the Captain General's vision was restored that he realised just how bad his situation was. Doing his best to triage what was left of his defensive line, he recalled his forces from five systems along the Lyran border that he deemed either beyond saving or simply not worth the effort. While he still could, he dispatched the Regulan Hazars to strike at the mech factories on Kava, hoping that it would prevent the Seacaf from cutting their vital Terran corridor. The Capellan Confederation armed forces were engaged elsewhere, however. Sensing that the end of the interdiction was imminent, they launched in October a major effort to retake Andurian. A pair of warships led the assault force, CCS Chengdu and Kalzan. Though the latter took damage during the battle at the Zenith, their incredible power cleared a path through half a dozen dropships, 40 aerospace fighters and several heavy weapons emplacements. As they scanned the system though, they realised that in orbit over the target world were two enormous Marek vessels, FWLS Kumba and Majestic. Another two warships were at more distant stations, meaning that the Seacalf's only chance was to blast their way through the defences at the capital before they were too heavily outnumbered. Their next engagement did not go well. 20% of their ground forces were destroyed before even making landfall, and the two Capellan warships were both annihilated, though not without at least taking the Atreus-class Majestic with them, the last of these venerable Freewell's battleships. Only two regiments had touched down in an organised fashion, the rest widely dispersed across the planet. With a trio of mech units in garrison, there was little hope of success now. After trying in vain for nine weeks to seize the capital, they eventually withdrew on December 29th. The Comstar War is one of the darkest chapters in Free Wells League history. Though the dispute between Maddock and Toyama had been resolved at a public level, behind the scenes, neither side would ever trust the other again. Any ambitions the two men might have had to take control of the other faction had gone up in smoke. Whether either of them could recover from this defeat was unclear.
and so ends another chapter of our history of the Second Succession War. With this episode, we have now passed the halfway point, and we're on course to have it conclude by the end of April. Exactly what counts as the Comstar War seems to vary with each sourcebook, and the term is used in different ways, uh, even within the main Second Succession War sourcebook. The way I've tried to use it is to limit it just to 37 and 38, where Safe and Rom were conducting a shadow war against each other, and the interdiction was in place. I know in the source books on the maps they cover right up to 2842 as part of the Comstar War, but I look at that as more of the after effects of that earlier crisis. Otherwise it just seems to be an arbitrary point in a few years time. If you thought the pain had stopped now for the Free Wells League, you're very much mistaken. The Capellan Confederation and Lyran Commonwealth are going to continue to advance towards them and take massive chunks out of their territory as they go. The Comstar War really only marks what is the start of their darkest chapter in their history. We also saw a change in rulership in the Draconis Combine, it's really the only other important thing of note going on at this time. It's a shame that Zabu Kurita never really gets a chance to lead the nation. I always found his character a bit tragic. Loyal to his brother right the way through, and when he finally gets a chance he gets stabbed in the back by his own military. But I think he understood just how precarious his position was as well. Certainly when the assassination takes place he makes no effort to fight it. Thank you very much for watching today's episode. You can support this channel by leaving me a like or leaving me a comment. Sharing it around also really helps with the algorithm, so if you've got friends or know of other people who might enjoy it, letting them know really helps me. If you want to support me in making these videos and don't want to wait another week for the next chapter, you can follow the link in the description below to my Patreon where I upload these videos as soon as I finish making them. I will be back next weekend for the 8th chapter. We've mentioned already it's going to be looking at the after effects of the Comstar War, but it's also going to be looking at a change in leadership within Comstar, and one of the most damaging and far-reaching operations to take place during this time in history, the results of which are still causing trouble centuries later. That of course is Operation Holy Shroud, so I hope you will join me again next time for that.